friends, colleagues, should we get started? Should we get the evening started? If I could ask you to sit down. Thank you very much. My name is, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, many of you have been attending the symposium, but for those of you who have not been, my name is Chase Robinson, I'm director of the museum. Good evening and welcome. It has been a very busy day and um, it, um, it now reaches its uh, thunderous culmination in our keynote speech. Something that we've all been very much looking forward to and I should say that I had the great pleasure of spending about half an hour with our speaker earlier today and you are in for a treat. I should say, of course, for those of you who are not part of the symposium, that this symposium, Provenance in Asian Art, a collaborative workshop and symposium, is a four-day event which has gathered a global community of Asian art provenance researchers to discuss the complexities of object histories and to consider how to best research, share, and debate provenance histories. Repatriation is predicated on provenance research. And tonight, Dr. Naman Ahuja will explore the various meanings and lasting impacts of repatriation. I should say that we're very pleased to have the support of the Macaulay Family Foundation who are sponsoring this keynote lecture. Dr. Ahuja is both a professor of Indian art and architecture and the Dean of the School of Arts and Aesthetics at JNU in New Delhi. He's held visiting professorships at the University of Zurich, the Kunsthistorisches Institute in Florence, the, Al the University of Alberta in Edmonton, and the School of Oriental and African Studies, where he himself is a graduate. He is also the curator of the Lumbini Museum, which is located in the birthplace of the historical Buddha the sacred garden area of Rupendi District, Nepal. Currently under development, the Lumbini will be a state-of-the-art museum dedicated to the early life of the historical Buddha and his journey to enlightenment. The museum is assembling a collection of archeological artifacts, architectural remnants, antiquities, manuscripts, and historic art, including objects that have been repatriated to Nepal from private international collections. Dr. Hooj and I were exchanging the contrasting responsibilities we have. I, um, I have nothing but admiration for his ambition and the ideas. And, um, and I'm sure we wish him all the best in this extraordinary important project. Dr. Hooj has also created any number of renowned exhibitions, for instance, the body in Indian art and thought, India and the World, A History in Nine Stories, where he staged conversations between historical objects brought to India from the British Museum and Indian objects sourced from some 25 Indian collections. Dr. Hooja has also curated the Indian collection at the British Museum, served also as editor of Marg, India's oldest journal of the arts. In some, his publications, activities, exhibitions, and television work have demonstrated the relevance of art history to wider contemporary issues, especially the intersections of international politics, provenance research, and restitution. His work, in this and other ways, exemplifies the ways in which politically or socially difficult narratives can be presented to the public. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Naman Ahuja, whose lecture is entitled, Repatriation, More Than Just a Shift in an Object's Location. Naman. Well, good evening and thanks. I should start by saying that the underfunded and beleaguered museum sector in Western countries could perhaps have prevented much of the current damage to their reputations if, as several museum professionals had advised, it had been more transparent over the past 30 years about exposing provenance research 
on its objects and maintained its standards on cataloging, registration, and conservation of the invaluable cultural heritage of which they are custodians. That, I think, needs to be taken by us on the chin as museum professionals. Point number two is that we need to recognize equally that the media certainly has a lot to answer for in not redressing the traction of unfiltered social media outcries on repatriation. I haven't counted, but there appear to be more people signing up for the various walkthroughs that expose the looting of Empire and the National Museum of Britain than there are buyers of tickets for their very worthy exhibitions of archaeology, and my colleagues at the BM seem rather sanguine about this. Why? Is even ignominy better than irrelevance? Is this narrative better than not having a raison d'etre at all? Good evening, friends. It is really a pleasure to be here amongst one's colleagues to try and look at our predicament together. I thank you, Chase Robinson, for your hospitality, everyone and the staff over here at the Smithsonian. Um, Joanna, Christine, you've done a fantastic job to be able to turn me from some fuddy, absent-minded professor and actually physically manifest me over here today. Thank you very much. Um, I come to you today with the hope that we can confront the chaos being unleashed as a group of peers. I've published various papers over the past 15 years that deal with the current problems, and I've curated exhibitions in which I've tried to address these issues practically to show how we can do, how we can do this. Now, I won't go into each paper or each of my projects, but I'll go over an overarching position with you, um, what my sen sense behind all of this work has been, and I leave it to you to quiz me or question me about it afterwards. Um, my talk this evening is guided by the intent of our jobs as art historians and museum curators to speak on how the next generation, too, will be inspired by the histories and beauty of human creative excellence that museums touched us with. But that celebration, really, is not the motivation behind the narratives in the media. Comparing the amount of news on repatriation against the histories communicated by the objects themselves, one would imagine that there's little readership left for history and archaeology, and the media can only sell more copy if the narrative is limited to scandal and theft. Now, you've been involved in, each of you working here, have been involved in fascinating studies that we have all been privileged to hear today, in paper after paper at this conference, rich with nuance and complex stories of how objects are collected. Yet, are we confronted with a situation where we are actually dealing with too little, too late? And that's part one of my paper the various double binds that we find ourselves in. I believe that in some cases, repatriation is both necessary and warranted. But who will determine which those cases are and on what grounds? We also need to think about the duration of the process of repatriation. The preparation of the new home for the repatriated and what needs to be done to train the new caretakers of that object. At the same time, in Western museums at least, we must address what could have been done to avert this requirement of repatriation and the requirement to ward off the many claims for repatriation that are not sustainable. Each of these matters warrant some clear thinking to update existing policies and laws and try and frame new ones. But before we go down the onerousness of listing what we now need to do, let us briefly outline what we ought to have done better thus far. What could have prevented this crisis that we are confronted with? An important moment was presented to the museums of UK, France, Belgium, Holland, and the United States over the 70 years since World War II to try and talk about colonialism and slavery. Whilst the efforts of the civil rights movement and now Black Lives Matter has made sure that they are acknowledged to some extent in the United States and especially in the more progressive museums here in Washington, such as the wonderful African American Museum. Many European countries, 
did not work this necessity into the narrative of their displays of Indian art. In fact, in a rather colonial and orientalist manner, South Asia's art is still presented in a religiously communal and divisive manner in galleries on Hindu, Buddhist, or Islamic art to foster the impression that it is religion that informs the identity of the region. These many lapses in reshaping the narratives of Asia have now been noticed and regrettably, rather than take a more carefully calibrated opinion or advice on reforming the storylines, the Western Museum is now without an alternative but to respond to rabble-rousing accusations made by those reclaiming their patrimony, even though it is guided by little more than being politically driven, mediatized photo ops. And here's an example of this. It says, you know, Twitter is awash with these kinds of things. Repatriation is becoming part of the narrative of hypernationalism, as we all know. And that's got the media backing behind it. So unwittingly, in the order to be able to do something good, we are fostering a certain narrative of hypernationalism that is on the rise all around us. And that's another thing that we are going to be complicit in 10 years later or 20 years later. Is our culpability in the rise of hypernationalism not going to be considered equally egregious as an institution in having fostered divisiveness in the garb of giving back? I leave this thought with you to ponder the weighing scales and see what, what, what we are doing, in the, what's in the balance. In India, there's a slogan that's going around, bring our gods back, not our heritage back. It's bring our gods back. What happens to all the manuscripts? What happens to all the textiles, the coins? Oh no, gods isn't told is being used as a euphemism. Really, is it? How many Indo-Islamic objects have gone back? And so, if you're not looking at the entire subject of heritage repatriation and cultural patrimony, but you're looking at it rather selectively to be able to bring gods back, then you're taking a one-sided approach and you're fostering a certain ideological hypernationalism. So the other double bind we are confronted with is the nature of public requirements through the narratives the museum itself puts out and how the media responds to this. An interesting showcasing of the narrative for repatriation and the museum's role in this was brought to attention 17 years ago by the British Museum in a wonderful manga called Professor Muna Carter's British Museum Adventure. I don't know if you've seen this uh, particular manga. A manga published in 2011 by the BM. Now, mangas, as you know, often take on difficult subjects in a beguiling comic book format. And this one presented a forthright statement on the position of the British Museum on repatriation and decolonization. In it, Professor Munakata, a scholar from Britain's Second World War rival, Japan, saves the British Museum from a militant Indian called Addis Singh who wants revenge for colonial despoliation. The absence of public narratives, at least to acknowledge the disquiet felt on account of colonialism and the loss of India's material wealth and cultural assets, was obviously being seen to be necessary by the British Museum, and so they came out with this comic book in 2011. Now, What's even more interesting in the plot for all of us provenance researchers here, Addis Singh is in cahoots with Laura Nielsen. She's the French descendant of those who were wronged in the colonial pilfering, profiteering in the Napoleonic Anglo-French wars, a symbol of which was the takeover of the Rosetta Stone, key to the world's languages from Napoleon by George III, and housed for public display at the British Museum as its greatest treasure. The story acknowledges two sets of old colonial thieves, how they might still be fighting over their loot. At the end of the narrative, 
the BM is shown to uphold the claim to shaping knowledge for public good for all nations as its duty. However, it does not render itself to be accountable to that claim. The narrative is humanized eventually in its conclusion where the legacies of loot are contrasted with the obsession of curators who wish to serve the collections and shape knowledge. One manga comic, however, does not fix all the wrongs, right? One richly contextualized, beautiful manga doesn't fix it all. Lobbying for and writing up the histories of the role of the Indian soldiers, the role Indian soldiers played on behalf of the Allied forces in, World War, in the World War, led to altering the public narratives in the Imperial War Museum too. However, other museums of history and art were not seen to be as active in shaping their curatorial storylines fast enough. By contrast, the same was not true in Germany where one can hardly visit any history museum or university town where there isn't an absolute public apology as a perpetual reminder of the Holocaust. This takes us to a recognition of more public discourse on how art and archeology span fare in conflict in the modern world. Rather than shield the public from these narratives, we are confront confronted instead by the requirement to tell these stories to our viewers and make them part of provenance research. What the museum's personnel do as their due diligence, making them both participants in shaping the narratives of viewing the history of these objects and how they have come to rest in their new homes. This is not to make our viewing public complicit in the looting, but to make them see the role that the museum plays in preserving histories. It is important to recognize that this is not a function that needs to be limited to Western museums only. Over the past few years, I've been writing about its necessity even in Indian museums and practically with examples on how Indian museums can go about doing this. And so that really brings me, um, these are some of the papers. This one was called Discourse on a Label, which was published by the Collège de France. And this is a small redaction of that, which was conflict, can museums tell us why? Um, it deals with some practical examples on how you can really deal with tough narratives of conflict in the public arena within a South Asian context. So, okay, so with repatriation, the spotlight on these matters will now fall on the source countries to which these objects are being returned. And that brings me to the second part of my talk, rather cheekily titled, How Now, Brown Cow? <laughs> How equipped are they to handle all this? Yes, I'm standing you here in front of you as a native informant to answer this provocative question. Not because I'm here to shame the Indian government for its litany of misdemeanors in the field of cultural management. Um, one is both a little inured and also aware that unless solutions to address systemic improvements are put in place, it is us specialists who will be at fault. So perhaps rather than just stating the nature of the looming crisis, I can try and ask instead what can now be done to help? Can this crisis be harnessed to help leverage the urgent needed attention museums and history need? That's the question and the precipice I think we are standing with in front of. There's been a long-standing argument that the museum infrastructure in Greece wasn't fit to get the Elgin marbles back and then Greece went and built the Acropolis Museum, a museum that is brilliantly thought through which achieves a quality of display and narrative strength that made that line of argument for holding on to the Parthenon freezes in the, in the British Museum come through as nothing short of being specious. The fate of museums and archaeology across Central Asia, the entire Indian subcontinent, and all of Africa outside of Cairo, however, is less than admirable and can't be compared with a brilliant museum. You don't have a brilliant Acropolis Museum in any of these places. But then the question is, should these countries be doubly punished and have, the, have their artifacts taken away from them? Clearly not. <laughs> 
The media in India has been putting this argument across rather volubly in very dramatic language in the past three years with a metaphor that asks if a poor mother should be denied her children that were taken away from her for adoption only because of her poverty. As I said earlier, we must factor the vector of how the media is shaping perception of our museum sector alongside. As a museum curator, this does put one in an unpleasant situation because our primary responsibility is, of course, our definition of curare, taking care of the object. And we have to see to it that museums of history in source countries can do that, can look after those objects. Narratives in the public domain will change, new research will come up, and the very same objects of history that are today being mobilized to tell histories of looting will tomorrow be used to tell a different kind of history. There will be different narratives which will be imperative, which will be seen as imperative for the next generation. So what are you and I as curators doing about looking after that evidence for the next generation? We are told that this job can be done equally well by the new custodians of the object. Will it? Really? No, actually, bar the lone grand example of the Acropolis Museum, f few other museums or departments of archaeology, at least in South Asia, have shown a capacity to withstand the vicissitudes of changing public narratives and, pub and political ideologies. No museum director in India ever resigned because the museum was not functioning properly or didn't have a complete inventory as we have just seen in the National Museum of Britain, right? So that level of accountability has never been fostered by an Indian administrator in the cultural sector. So the question we are really being asked is what is the capacity building that has been put in place to grant the museum sector the professionalism it requires, grant it the autonomy it constitutionally needs in order to be able to maintain a historiography of the narratives that surround their collections. These matters are entirely dependent on the caliber and training of personnel that work in the heritage and museum sector. Our countries like India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and Sri Lanka, if I look at only my own surroundings, investing adequately in the education of art historians, curators, archeologists, and the institutions they're meant to run in order to be able to look after all of this great repatriation and patrimony. The quantum rise in heritage and archives need much larger investment and deployment of resources. The solutions-based efforts made at addressing this flip side needs greater public attention and discussion by us. Nearly 100 specialized posts in the field of art history, epigraphy, conservation, and such allied posts could not be filled for 20 years at the National Museum of India until eventually the finance ministry said that the very provision for having these posts was irrelevant and they were scrapped by the government. So the 100 vacancies for specialist curators are now, don't even exist. There are very few universities that teach these subjects. In an ecosystem that has become one that is geared to delivering short, media-driven factoids or headlines, we have seen that there is a decline in the training of long-form writing, as well as object-based study, or the training of curators who can write on art. If the reason for the repatriation is to seek public accountability for the removal of artifacts from a place without the consent of its people, then we need to assess if repatriating it will now address those very requirements. The repatriation of objects is not possible without detailed studies on their provenance. So who is training these provenance historians in India and where? We aren't. <laughs> and I don't know any of my other colleagues who are. The rapid rise of museums and collections in India will need these trained specialists and I'm going to outline some urgent reasons as to why we need to look, about, look upon this more quickly. It's not a slow matter. Now, one thing I should say is, the question I was asked is, 
as I was very generously introduced by Chase Robinson as having this sort of grand vision and ambition for the museum sector and culture uh, for South Asia, I am really an ancient India specialist. My core area of expertise is very early Indian minor antiquities. And that's what I continue to work on and publish on. So why am I doing this talk as an ancient Indian art expert? Well, over the past 15 years, I've written up a few studies about why things are being smuggled out of India in the first place. Why was it that the objects that I was studying and writing about were to be found in museums and in private collections and with dealers all over the planet? How come they were so easy to smuggle out of India? They were all recent discoveries. And I was forced to examine the laws and discovered that laws that were framed once to protect heritage have become counterproductive and have proven to be impracticable. They're also now antithetical to the guiding principles of the current global socioeconomic framework that we find ourselves in. And this was published in some of these articles in the media. The ruination of sites and smuggling of artworks is not happening because of a greater desire to own these objects in the West, even though we've had some fantastic exposés of Subhash Kapoor and Douglas Latchford, for instance. The really larger scale of ruination is at the hands of urbanization, mining, and deforestation. The media seems to have made up its mind that objects are being looted from sites for the sake of the art market. The art market is where they end up, but they are not being looted from sites for the art market. The looting initially on the ground is happening for other reasons. They're ending up at the art market. But why are they getting looted from the site in the first place? Why is the site not being preserved? That's the question that I would rather focus on. The truth is that a desire for the possession of art objects is no longer the main driving force for the desecration or pillaging of ancient sites. The economy is pegged to the construction of metros, dams, smart cities, expanding agriculture. South Asia is, is encountering a pace of development never seen before in its history, and both cultural and archaeological contexts are being disturbed forever. Most often, no developer, even if the developer is the government, which is supposed to be the caretaker of heritage, ever reports the discovery of artifacts for fear that archaeologists may slow down or even stop the development work. The absence of any reported antiquities during the construction of the Delhi Metro is a prime example of such apathy. Whereas all other major historic cities like Paris, Rome, and London use the opportunity of their metro development to create museums filled with pottery, coins, and artifacts found during the excavations, we've been led to believe in Delhi, nothing was found while digging in Mehroli in the shadow of the Qutub Minar, in Tuglakabad, or in Chandni Chowk, in Shah Jahanabad. Opportunities are being lost, objects are being lost, so are you all going to live with the prayer that some intrepid private art dealer rescued those objects which you can put into your museums? Or are you going to damn that private collector? You know, who, who are we battling in the source country? Our battle here is not the same battle there, is what I'm trying to make a difference between. Economic development and the government's and the government aren't enemies we in the culture sector and heritage sector have shown much willingness to battle in recent years. Nor have we addressed the quantum in their damage in our, in our policy making. We in archaeology and museum sectors have allowed instead the narrative of evil colonialism and some amount of awful image, some kind of awful image to emerge of art collecting as being linked to smuggling contraband alongside the funding of illegal militias and arm trader, arms traders. So returning to the real enemy, as I was saying, we know that we cannot win against economic development. That's a battle we can't win. And we also know that we must work alongside the very governments that are embarking on major development projects to salvage what we can in such situations and preserve that in museums. Think back to the days of the construction of the Nagarjuna Sagar Dam or the Aswan Dam in Egypt. What fantastic work was done by mobilizing archaeologists and museums then, at that time, in the 1950s and then early 60s, 
why has all this stopped happening in the past 50 years? Why, we must ask, therefore, have Indian policymakers become alienated from thinking of the archaeological survey of India and the museum as a complement to urban development rather than something that they have to battle? It is because these two institutions have repeatedly shown that they are spent, underfunded, and incapable of protecting what they are burdened with already, and certainly do not have the capacity to take on the quantum rise in artifacts from the contexts that have been disturbed in the past 30 years. Even reporting the negligence or ruination of ancient sites seldom, seldom interests the media. Most of these ancient ruins lie unprotected, and now the governments of many countries, India included, cannot even afford the salaries of the chokidars or the security personnel at these sites, what to speak of increasing the cadres of archaeologists and art historians that are needed for all the newly discovered sites and new museums. The sites are being looted as a result, and this will not stop if you keep apportioning guilt to Western museums and collectors rather than hold source countries accountable for not making the requisite changes at home. Given the nature of its statements and its privatization of museums, the government in India has clearly realized that it needs to attract investment in the functioning of the culture sector, heritage, antiquities, as well as modern and, and in the field of modern and contemporary art. However, privatization, which seems to be the buzzword in liberalized India, as it's being encountered in the current manner without proper policy in place, and without specialist administrators trained in the concerned disciplines is almost a despairing cop-out, not a solution. Museums of historical art have not held any purchase committees for over 30 years now. So if Indian museums aren't collecting the salvage, where's it all going to go? No Indian museum has had a purchase. They were supposed to be legal purchase committee meetings that used to be held annually. So all the dealers of India and art collectors of India would go to the lawns of the Allahabad Museum, the National Museum, the Prince of Wales Museum, and all the dealers would put up their stalls for one week, and a committee of art experts appointed by the museum would vet the objects and decide that, all right, this year we have a budget of X, and this is what we're going to spend it on. And objects used to be brought to them of what had been recently decanted from the Maharaja of somewhere's library or from some new urban development that had taken place. All this stopped 30 years ago. These purchase committee meetings haven't been held. So where are all the objects now going to go if Indian museums aren't buying them? Um, the private sector and collector needs to be educated and also regulated constructively. The need for the government to both incentivize the private sector and laying down informed ethical policies for it to protect its heritage are both urgent. But again, just like the government no longer salvages the sites that are in peril because of development, Indian citizens have become petrified of collecting pre-modern art. And we must ask, why such few people are stepping up to preserving what is being discovered. Surely, in a country of a billion Indians, there must be a few hundred that are really interested in antiquities who will go and rescue what is coming out of the site and pay half the price that somebody is willing to pay in dollars to be able to protect it and keep it within India. So why aren't they doing it? It must be recognized here that the policy needs to be shaped not only, a policy needs to be shaped, not only keeping elite collectors in mind, but also to find ways of asking the common man to start helping with the ownership and protection of history. Now, some, we always seem to take one step forward, two step backward. So a few measures were put in place by the government about 10 years ago, but I don't really see what's really coming off those. How many little small town private museums have really been enabled? How many private pe people have set up little village museums in their garages? You know, this was supposed to be incentivized. Government was meant to be giving you money for this. But I was on the committee that used to give the funds for this. And it was, it was a difficult, it was an impossible committee. No decisions used to get taken. Everything was postponed for the next fiscal year. 
the awards that were actually being given were so small and meager, the, the possibilities of actually making a practical change through that committee were hopeless. Um, the media perception and laws, on the other hand, make owners feel like they are holding contraband or engaged in some kind of smuggling. Unless they change their position, we will never unleash the potential workforce for the heritage sector that we need in India or South Asia. Our real solution to present to the present problem, lie, solutions to the present problem, lie in addressing what it will take for making the necessary emendations to the laws for private collecting, for easing the legal sale and ownership of antiquities in India, for increasing the educational role of museums and bringing art history into the high school curriculum. Without these steps, we will not address the root causes about why we face the crisis we do. Let us also note the urgency with which this needs to be done. The Indian Prime Minister has declared that his government will build the largest museum in the world in New Delhi. Alongside, we have had 450 objects which have just been repatriated and many more will follow. These new museums and objects need personnel and infrastructure. Who now will write up that narrative of these repatriated objects? It is time to harness the opportunity and the, growing, and the growing confidence with which governments in the Global South are backing repatriation. It signals shifts in the economic stature of source countries, and it also now demands fundamental shifts within their internal fiscal allocations for culture, practical changes in the laws governing art and heritage, and an urgent upgrading of curricula for the higher education and training of the cadre of civil servants and arts administrators who look after heritage. These conversations need to enter more serious bilateral government meetings, and occasions like the G20 are being missed to have those kinds of pointed conversations. So this brings me to part three of four of my talk, which is the solution-oriented trusteeship of a global commons. Preserving this, as somebody once said, this, all these narratives that are coming up and these are what's preserved in the director's office and who preserves the emails and who preserves the previous displays and the exhibition narratives. Well, it's preserving, as I call it, the ocean of the sea of stories, which is a, a very famous phrase. It's the title of an old book called the Katha Sarit Sagar. And who's going to preserve that ocean of the sea of stories? Having spoken at some length about what needs to be done in source countries, I'd now like to look at all of us to return to what can be done better and improved on here in the West. The question we need to ask is whether the return of the object in question is going to fix the narrative. What is being repatriated is being done as a symbolic gesture. It cannot right the wrongs of history. However, it can help create a more powerful, symbolically potent narrative that gives people, once oppressed, the satisfaction of justice served. And symbolism is all we can communicate through the objects we are custodians of. Repatriation of an object is just too little to ask for and expect those generations of poverty and deep civilizational scars to be wiped off by that gesture. So if repatriation isn't enough, what is? Repatriating countries need to send back more than just the physical object. They need to help source countries develop the infrastructure that they need. The major question then is, if the government has to take recourse to creating frameworks for guiding international collaboration in capacity building, knowledge sharing, and privatizing aspects of museums and heritage management, what does such a privatization mean for the long-term security of heritage? What will be its guiding principles by which public-private ownership of heritage can be regulated? These questions are urgent because otherwise, in a liberalized economic setup in India, there will be no safeguards and procedures that will be put in place in time for all of this. One of the reasons we are seeing a rise in the demand for the, re the return of cultural patrimony is because of a delayed public acknowledgement of the narratives of racism and the atrocities of empire and colonialism. We can do right by bringing those narratives more, making those narratives more public. The continuing presence of the East as a land of transcendentalism 
and known through its religious culture, precludes its agency as a land of science, of fostering global trade. It precludes Asian countries from a discourse on banking. It precludes Asian countries from a discourse on industry. In short, from the narratives of progress. And the narratives of progress happen in the Enlightenment Gallery, which justifies the existence of the museum. These narratives and nomenclatures of our galleries in the West urgently need redress. India cannot continue to be typecast in the way that it is. And then you can't bemoan that, oh, well, there's a religiously guided ideological government in power. I mean, the narrative that you've been conditioning and educating people on in the world is that there was a period of Hindu art and there was a different period which was Islamic art. You didn't create those galleries that had the overlaps, that spoke of the murky in-betweens. With wars, mass migrations, and diasporas, um, we stand at a moment in history when questions need to be addressed again on who owns and has the right to speak for cultural artifacts. As we are seeing all around us, with globalization comes the anxiety of reclaiming and preserving cultural specificity. And the requirement to address the violence endured by communities historically. With growing globalization, the threat communities face of losing their culture leads to heightened nationalism and this engenders different versions of history, right? So multiple narratives are now emerging of looking at the same object from a completely different point of view. So let me, allow me a one minute digression to explain how this happens in my own career, how this panned out. So the critique that the Universal Museum got was that it is universal if you live in Bloomsbury, right? But it's not universal to anyone living in India or Africa or anywhere. I mean, they weren't able to fly to Bloomsbury to partake of their cultural patrimony there. And so the international touring arm of the British Museum, there was a policy decision, and backing the success of the history of the world in a hundred objects, um, it was seen that this cultural heritage of the world in a hundred objects could be turned into an exportable exhibition that the British Museum could loan to Canada, to Australia, to India, and other places. They arrived in India, and of course, the immediate response was, well, your version of a hundred objects that tell the world's history is not our version of the way in which we tell the history of the world, and the way in which we look upon British history and Indian history is rather different compared to the narrative you've put out. And so, sorry, no can do. We don't want your version of a hundred objects, and we're not taking it. And so, an interesting conversation happened, and curatorial workshops ensued where it was decided that certainly um, there needs to be a different way at looking at these things. I'm, I'm using Professor Munakata as my foil through this, uh, uh, through this exercise. And the point was that, all right, then how does the co-production of knowledge really work? How does co-curation really work? What's my version? As when I was tasked with coming up with another 100 objects out of Indian collections that was to be staged in dialogue, and there was a certain requirement to be able to look at global history from an Indian perspective, which is very challenging because it really hasn't been done. What language am I going to do it in? In the language of English? The language of my colonial oppressor? Or am I actually going to try and tell that narrative in Hindi or Farsi or Urdu or any other language? Do I have the vocabulary to be able to look at the history of Chile or Peru or the New World? There might be. I might be able to tell a history of the Sasanians through Sanskrit sources, but can I actually tell a history of, of the New World without having to mediate it via the history of colonialism, via Spanish, French, or English? And there were other much more serious methodological problems on how is India going to participate in a history of the world on its version of history? What is going to be the language of discourse through which India is going to do it? What will be the versions of history that India will tell? And it led to very serious, academically challenging moments that one really needs to think about. What repatriation and cultural patrimony and globalization, how do they all actually fit together? <laughs> 
How do we put these variables together in the, mu in the museum context? Now, all of this will require curatorial narratives, and I've written this up, some, at least some of these things up in detail elsewhere, and we haven't the time to go into all of these matters. But this will require curatorial narratives to include histories of conflict. That's very important. And the imminent crisis curators face on the safety and maintenance of these artifacts now makes us seek better, more nuanced models for their governance than what we currently employ. The only way to prevent this is to create a system of checks and balances through a jury or a board of trustees, I believe. UNESCO has been using an excellent phrase to describe the nature of these cultural assets as global commons. That's what they call it. And it is a phrase, um, uh, and I think it's, it's something that we should reconvene about the next time round to discuss how practically we should draft what this trusteeship might look like. One which fosters the co-production of curatorial narratives and global partnership in the preservation of those cultural assets. Now, over the past decade, this revelation of the difference between past and present has led to very serious attacks on museums and heritage sites all over the world, the most glaring examples being Tunisia and Syria, Belgium in the museum or Afghanistan. India, in turn, faces its own vulnerabilities, and the museum's security needs to be both physically, needs to be both physical and extended to autonomy in its affairs, without which we cannot be held accountable for safeguarding the objects that are being repatriated. So this brings me to the last part of my paper, which is the land versus the people. Who is it all being repatriated for? Is identity linked more to a place or to a people? In our current global climate, and indeed the entire history of migration since the Second World War, should force us to acknowledge that heritage needs to move with the communities who seek to make other parts of the world their home rather than the land in which it was first made. Addressing this will require a much greater investment by the governments of these countries to create frameworks for bilateralism in sharing cultural assets and more sage meditation than the accusatory slogans of theft. The questions get more tricky. Laws to protect antiquities are imposed by a nation. Well, what happens when the government suddenly changes to a different political persuasion and a nation, as previously defined, ceases to exist? If the museum is subject to shifting ideological whims, it stands to ignore the culture of those now in minority. These matters get magnified in times of war and conflict. In the case of Tibet in 1959, the exodus that accompanied the Dalai Lama to India was followed by a shift in their movable cultural heritage. Icons, tankas, sculptures that went with the performance of rituals necessary for their religious identity and functioning were relocated to where they were now going to perform those rituals. Terrible atrocities, we know, were perpetrated on what was left behind in Tibet. And untold quantities of artifacts, therefore, made their way to the international art market via China, Hong Kong, Kathmandu, and Bangkok, which became the shopping centers for everyone to go and buy these objects. Precarious conditions in source countries have led to redeployments of their artifacts for reasons other than looting alone. Let's look at another example, that of Afghanistan, a country where the educated intelligentsia and the larger proportion of its middle classes now live in diaspora, scattered across the world. Many of them have taken what little they could as mementos of their rich civilization, a textile woven for a wedding of one of their ancestors, a carpet that once supported a family feast, a piece of jewelry, a powerful example of the long traditions of ancient Gandhara, perhaps, a community different from the one who lost it, has often undertaken the responsibility for the maintenance of the site and the material artifact. And that maintenance may be taking place now in a manner that is perhaps differently driven from how it was originally conceived. Such cases are aplenty. They force one to acknowledge as to how valid it is to attach heritage to a place rather than to a people. After all, it is the people who make up the place and these are objects held onto by people to inform their identities in the land that they now regard as home. 
A much bigger question therefore hangs in the balance. Does heritage belong to the land from which it comes or to the people who love it? Robbing refugees and diasporic communities of their cultural patrimony to send it back to the nation state that they have fled will be seen as perverse by human rights activists and the UNHCR, even though it may be permissible under the 1970 UNESCO regulation on heritage. Right? So which law do you want to uphold? Which side do you want to lend your bleeding heart to more? Rather than the ownership of a cultural asset, globalization should force resources to be deployed in the sharing of knowledge that a cultural asset can generate. The co-production of knowledge is a better way for different nations to share the responsibility of ownership, whereby each can hold the other accountable to do their fair share. Somebody from India needs to be saying, you need to put out that narrative of colonialism and rapacious looting. And somebody from here seems to be saying, well, actually that object is symbolic of these five other things that you're not telling the public about, and you're only putting it in one, one kind of history. There needs to be a sharing of, of how we can each hold each other to account. Um, the precise fate of India's neighbor, neighbors may not exactly be as bad as situations might be in certain parts of India yet. However, there are vast numbers of Indians who live in diaspora who similarly have a claim to their heritage in the United States, Singapore, UK, Canada, or wherever else they now may reside. Their governments too have to be seen as being inclusive and thus showcase the heritage of those communities in their public museums. In the past few decades, redefining a national project has become necessary in a world where families and identities are hyphenated. Indian people, while simultaneously belonging to some other part of the world, I mean, the people, everyone's a speaker of multiple languages, and even traditionally people have been speakers of multiple languages. Indians identify with language groups Punjabi or Sindhi, Nepali or Bhutia, Tibetan or Tamil. None of these are spoken only in Nepal or Bhutan or Tamil Nadu. I mean, these are all languages that are spoken by language groups on the borders by millions of people across different countries. Let alone the extraordinary rise of mixed race citizens in diasporas. Um, migrations of people will always be accompanied by a migration of their heritage, which will need preservation in museums that are in their new homes. After all, at some point, the deracinated or the uprooted also becomes naturalized. It lives on in a new context. So how many generations will it take for Indian art to feature as the national art of the United States? Can we be so impervious to change that new home, the new home and context can be completely disregarded? What does depriving current owners of an object achieve? Does it actually bring a museum visiting conservation and museum maintaining habit to the country to which the object is being repatriated? And then there is a the very real need of the enormous diasporas of colonized com communities now living in the countries that colonize them who may well have claims to the objects to be integrated into the narratives of the countries that they call home. What has driven museums, I'm now going to try and sum up my talk. What has driven museums and art history towards provenance studies? The media may have been driven by social justice. However, the narratives that provenance research have, has unleashed over the past decade are much richer. They are filled with nuance. They are traversing forensics, social networks, changing political contexts, and they are filled with the all too humanizing circumstances under which individuals collected something. Ultimately, we must ask where all this provenance research is really heading. What's the meta-narrative that's being constructed? Provenance researchers have frequently encountered the double bind that I began with, of narratives 
that were ennobling and edif edifying objects that inspired the creation of scholars 100 years ago or 200 years ago, as much as they have been about inequitous power relations. Both sides of the spectrum are true. As an academician, I am interested in using provenance research to learn about how knowledge is formed and how knowledge is shaped. What did the 18th century library and museum collect? How was it different in China? How was it different in the Indian library? And what were the imperatives that guided the European library? Was the 10th century education system's priorities different from the education system? What was the curriculum? What were the books that were held for the curriculum for the training of the 10th century Indian elite as opposed to the 20th century Indian elite? These questions can be answered by provenance research. And how did those museums and librarians and those personnel collect their work in an age in no age has the acquisition of knowledge been divorced from power. That we must accept. This we know from more popular readings, whether it's Alvin Toffler's Knowledge is Power, or from Foucault, or from the many studies on colonialism. So the public needs to get involved in these meta-narratives now. My starting point this evening was not whether repatriation should or should not be done, if it's a good thing or not a good thing. The demand for repatriation of objects to source countries is only going to increase. That's a given. With that come lots of other expectations of things we need to do in the museum sector to be able to improve what we, how we function and what we can deliver. I think Indians bristle when they see their things in beautiful museums abroad. It evokes anger, but that anger could have been prevented if there were equally compelling exhibitions of Indian art in India. If there were equally beautiful museums in India, there would, might just be a little bit more generosity in sharing. But at the moment, the narrative is one of deprivation because you see them looking so beautiful abroad and you just can't see them looking like that in India. And so the narrative is not about repatriating the object. You could quell that by teaching Indians how to make their museums equally beautiful and equally important. So a lot of museums have been trying to do this. The British Museum, the VNDA, the Nehru Collections for the Indian Trust, the, University, the Art Institute in Chicago, the Smithsonian has been trying to do it, the Met has been running a project, but you turn around and say, well, some of these projects have been running for 30 years. And if they've been running for as long as that, what's come out of it? Why is there nothing to show for it? Why are these projects not resulting in what they should? What's wrong with the way we are running these projects? And I think there's something we can do to fix them. Um, so museums preserve a whole variety of ways of looking at objects and mobilizing them to inspire and train the next generation of historians, artists, writers, and curators in source countries as much as they do over here. We are seeing an unprecedented rise of destruction of cultural heritage, and this presents an opportunity to make governments take action and support salvage operations and justify and show that they really do care about the heritage rather than just a mediatized photo op afforded by the repatriation. Rescue and commandeering of artifacts cannot be the only way museums in India and South Asia build their collections. Our museums have to reinstate the habit of purchasing collections of national importance. And if the ethics of public-private partnerships are to be considered, then its policies need to be put down. While presenting the more fashionable narrative these days of decolonization, I think what I've been trying to communicate that we also have to look at the limits of decolonization, of which repatriation seems to be a part. Not all the ills that our world faces can be laid at the door of colonialism. Many can, but not all. <laughs> so it would be short-sighted to imagine that a participation in a mediatized narrative of decolonization is suddenly going to fix all our problems. The inequities of caste, for instance, was not a gift of colonialism alone. 
or the inequities of gender, or the problems of climate change, or mining. These are not the gift of colonialism. These are current problems that India faces, which are not narratives that are going to be fixed because of a decolonizing narrative. So not all ills of society are going to be, not all social justice is going to be served by subscribing to this decolonization narrative. Museums are, in the final analysis, all about these various narratives that they put out, and they must recognize that one moment and one generation of narratives is not the only set of narratives. These objects have to be used to be able to tell the next generation's narratives also, and those are going to hold us to account on matters of climate change. The fact that I had to fly across and burn, have so much carbon emission to come and stand in front of you to be able to have this conversation. I might be culpable of that tomorrow, right? So the need to, put the, to preserve these narratives becomes extremely difficult. And we also have to be cautious about our current global politics, which we are feeding in terms of hyper-nationalism. Hyper Questions have to be asked now if the narrative of repatriation is being exploited for the sake of this hypernationalism. For instance, do we know of any example in the past 10 years in the case of Indian art where the repatriation of Indo-Islamic artworks is also being fought for? Or is the restoration of India's national glory pegged largely to the restitution of Hindu culture? This is extremely important, lest Black Lives Matter and decolonization narratives are instrumentalized in the service of agendas they hadn't envisaged. Equally, on the European and American side is the unfortunate delay in mobilizing the colonizing narrative that led to intolerance. And nowhere has this been felt more greatly than in an age of Brexit in Europe. These narratives that could have done much to, in, to reduce national chauvinism and admit multicultural societies into Western institutions should have been done for the past 75 years. The delay in doing so has not just led to vitriolic public demonstrations in Black Lives Matter and separatism in the West, but worst of all, it has left substantial populations alienated from their museums. Now, I'm going to end simply by saying, um, what we are seeing is that the rise of provenance studies has emerged as one of the most important disciplinary aspects of art history, which is directly concerned with politics that seek to redress histories of political violence. Contained in the narratives that emerge on the provenance of objects are a variety of significant contexts, including migrations, multicultural and mixed race identities, and the claims on war, and on the claims on war booty. Does it belong to the usurper or the vanquished? How far back in time can we go with provenance? And what is the right thing to do once we know the history? Bringing cases of historical wrongs of four or five generations to book is one matter, but can things that were done 20 or more generations ago still be brought to a court of justice today? Is it correct to do that? I mean, how far back do you go? Each context will make us judge current ownership differently. Taking care of the collections is vital because those that are utilized, uh, because, the, because it is the collections that are utilized and reinvented in each generation to tell the stories they want to. We cannot deny that. But what can we do to protect the many narratives or histories that the museum enables? I think this ultimately is what we need to think about because that is what our job profile is. Thank you. We have a few moments for questions if anyone would like to offer one. Yes. Hi, Nauman. Uh, I'm here. Yes. Hi. I wanted to ask you uh, to comment on the uh, fate of the National Museum building. Sorry, I apologize. Uh, the answer is that we don't really know. It's shrouded in mystery. We have been trying to get a straight answer on this question for a while. Um, rumor has it that the National Museum of India is going to be demolished imminently. We were told that this was the case because the central vista of Delhi, which is the equivalent of the Champs-Élysées, 
which is the grand boulevard that runs through the city of Delhi, designed by Edwin Lutyens, um, has, is bisected with a road which is called Janpat, the people's road. In the urban planning of the city of Delhi, it was envisaged that the four cultural institutions, the National Archives of India, the Museum of Indian Folklore, and the Living Cultures of India, that is, the Museum of Antiquities and the Archaeological Survey of India were going to form the four quadrants at this intersection. These were equidistant at a fair distance away from the Capitol Hill equivalent, which is Rashtrapati Bhavan and the Secretariat buildings, which were on one side of the boulevard. And on the other side was the ancient fort called Purana Kila, the history of India, the seat of governance of the Sultan, the, uh, the Delhi Sultanate, which even had under it the ancient city of Indraprastha and so on, the ancient archeology. span So there was antiquity, the history of Delhi on one side, bisecting it the cultural district, and then the seat of governance for the new capital. This was the urban planning as envisaged in 1911. A narrative for decolonization has been put through to be able to look upon this as a, not a very good vision and to recast it. And the recasting is that uh, buildings are going to be changed. These look like sort of 1950s modernist buildings, a lot of the secretariat buildings and government buildings were built in the 1950s, and they're not seen to be fit to purpose now, nowadays. And they can be better air conditioned, they can be smarter looking. India was not necessarily the richest country in the world when it made those buildings in, 19, in the early 50s, and it did what it could. They are the markers of a certain age. At any rate, in the great new uh, redevelopment that is envisaged for New Delhi, um, the buildings of all of the government buildings, not the historic ones which are more than 100 years old, but the rest are going to be demolished and re rebuilt. And that includes the National Museum of India, which is going to be turned into an office block. Instead, what has been proposed is that the National Museum is going to be relocated. And at first, we didn't know where it was going to be relocated. There was a rumor that it was going to be relocated into the old Red Fort. Then that idea was scotched. Then we were told that it was going to be relocated into the North and South Block, which are the two secretariat buildings designed by Herbert Baker, which are on top of the Acropolis, the Capitol Hill, as it were. And uh, the, the buildings are huge. They were designed as office buildings in the 1920s is when they were, they were put to work. Um, we have hundreds of rooms. Um, and they are supposed to become the new National Museum of India. So it's going to be a very different urban experience. Um, shifting the National Museum is, as anyone knows, from shifting a library or shifting a museum, it's an, a nightmare. Um, you have to have armies of trained specialists who know how to pack each and every object, store it, know how to have access to that object while it is in store for the five years or 10 years that it's going to be in storage while the new building is constructed. Uh, you are lucky if you have a museum inventory, but in many institutions, especially anyone who works in a national museum, which has hundreds of thousands of objects, you know that no museum has a complete and comprehensive inventory. Inventory making is an ongoing process in any mu real museum. You always building your inventory and finishing your job of inventorizing your collection. Um, well, the hundreds of thousands of things in India that need inventorizing across India is huge. So, I mean, maybe the crisis is an opportunity, Karen. <laughs> Thank you I don't you know so what much. else to say. So, Naman will join us for our reception upstairs, and I... And we can chat more then. And we, uh, yes, I encourage you to chat more. Uh, thank yes. you all very much. Thank you.